Sawona. Ask a stranger on a busy street of downtown Joburg or a corner in Umlazi for a translation of the Zulu word, and the quick answer they might give you is hello. If you try your luck with someone with a little more time on their hands, they might tell you of the literal translation of the word, which is more insightful, we see you. If they had enough time, they might tell you that it's not so much a banal announcement of the sight of the person you encounter, but rather an acknowledgement of another's presence, of their personhood, of their humanity as they stand before you. With even more time, they might further explain that we is not a royal affectation, but it is a recognition of the interconnectedness of people in keeping with Ubuntu, best understood by the aphorism, a person is a person through others. The fellow praxis of Bantu language speakers across Southern Africa, such that in the act of acknowledging another's humanity, it is not something they do alone, but in community with others. I think about this, we see you, when I encounter two portraits from South African photographer Zanele Muholi's first solo exhibition, titled Only Half the Picture, depicting images of queer blackness, black lesbians, butch women, and trans men. One of the portraits is called, What Don't You See When You Look At Me? In that portrait, or one of the first, the midsection of a belted and trousered person is shown. Excluding the right side, we are confronted with a recently scarred forearm, congealed blood and scarring tissue surrounding pink flesh still healing. What don't you see when you look at me too, sees us or sees planted firmly on concrete step, the shiny black square shaped shoes of a sharply dressed sitter and gray green trousers. Maybe it's the same person, maybe it's two people, maybe they are a man, maybe it's two men, maybe it's a woman, Maybe it's two women, maybe it's a man and a woman. Maybe they are a trans-masculine person. Maybe they are gender non-conforming. Maybe they're not so sure. Maybe. There's so many questions. And here, really, we have only obsessed over the gender categorizations. What about questions such as, why are their arms scarred? How long will it take to heal? Whose house does the stoop belong to? Are they happy or sad? Are they on their way to work? Or are they in their Sunday best? Do they even go to church? Do they believe? If so, why not? If not, why? The answers to those questions are perhaps beside the point. You can't tell much about this person from what you see. My name is Panashe Chigumadzi. I come from, or rather I was born in Zimbabwe and I live in South Africa. I am an essayist, I'm a novelist, um, and those are two, really the two mediums that I work in, sort of essays um, and fiction. I think that, I mean, particularly South Africa that I live in is a very young country as well as a very old country. So just um, the many contestations that are there, the very deep or rich history that we have right now. And right now there are a lot of sort of contestations as the country really begins to sort of grapple with itself and what it means um, 22 years after sort of the fall of formal um, apartheid. And so it really, um, although it's, it's very personally painful, um, I really appreciate South Africa for what it illuminates about the world um, and also sometimes invisibilizes. So I really appreciate South Africa um, from that perspective as a writer because it really gives me a lot of different um, perspectives on the world. So it's a really great vantage point for South Africa, um, of the world. Um, the worst thing about being a writer in South Africa, um, I think that I find that our, our writing or at least our publishing industry is one that is if South Africa often sees itself as almost the America of Africa, for example, so it can be quite, it's, it's, it's an industry that works quite well, it's re relatively well, um, a good infrastructure, but that also means that it often doesn't see outside um, um, it, the, its borders, particularly um, doesn't see much of the rest of the continent, um, particularly with, with contemporary writers, and we don't really do enough with each other, I find, in comparison to the ways in which, you know, if you were in Nigeria or um, Uganda and, uh, you know, other African countries, which I also think have the inverse problem, which they look too much outwards, whereas we look too much um, inwards. Um, so I think that's something that I would really sort of like to see, um, you know, improve in, in South Africa. 
just top of the top of my my head what i really miss is cheap food um uh, america is really expensive or just if you're outside south africa you just and outside the continent food is really expensive and good food is is expensive um and i like food so i'd like some <laughs> a little bit more of that um yeah, I, I think that I, I think more than anything, I miss my people. I think that's that's beyond the place. I, I miss I miss that sense of home. Um, yeah, and I think. Yeah. Yeah, I think one thing that I've begun to try, at least intellectually, be comfortable with is just the idea that writing is at least my writing goes in cycles. So there are times when. I really just cannot be taken away from my laptop. I'm just writing and writing and writing. And the other times where literally it will be two months and I, and I won't be able to touch anything and I can't write anything. And that's always a very scary moment because you always think, is this the end of my writing career? And sort of just allowing yourself to also understand that even in those processes when you aren't writing, that is also the process of writing. Um, you need to sit and process um, your work and so I usually don't I don't always enjoy writing it's actually a very painful process I usually enjoy the afterwards I'm like oh wow did you do that you know that's that's the the the, the process I probably enjoy the end is probably the thing I enjoy most about writing but aside from that I really like the reading that I do for a lot of my writing I could I could probably make many excuses but I need to read 10 books for this essay when I probably could get away with two um, so that's probably the thing I enjoy most about being a writer also is the ability to spend weeks on end just reading and say that's part of my work. I can't say definitely that a writer has a public duty, um, although I know that for myself I do think that there's a sense of responsibility that I think <clears throat> I impose on myself and particularly those I admire that if you occupy public space and you're occupying public time it's not that you need to be right all the time but I think the thing that I that I hold um, most important is that you need to be honest and that you need to be um, you need to do the best that you can possibly do and by honesty that is really sort of trying to be as reflective as possible so the answer that I might give to something five years ago or even a year ago might be very different to what I do now, but that's a process of sort of the evolution. But at least if I'm being honest with myself and I've really um, subjected myself to the best sort of standards, whenever I give an opinion, it's not just the sort of what's ever the top, top of my head. Um, I really try and give it the best and that at least is what I think about as a, as a public duty um, as someone who occupies some sort of um, public space. But I, I wouldn't really sort of say, I find it difficult to impose that this is what you should do. This is just what I would prefer, and those are the writers that I, I really admire are those people who've taken the sense of responsibility um, about occupying people's mind space and timeshare really um, seriously. That's a difficult one. I, I think that, you know, particularly with some of the work I've done with um, um, the writing industry in South Africa, and particularly for black writers, um, you know, we're really dealing with the legacies and the continuities of, of apartheid and structurally, and that, that really f uh, filters into how sort of the whole publishing industry works. And in that sort of case, you see that the individual actions of a couple of people are not going to fundamentally change a structural um, um, issue. I think you have important um, interventions that we can make and I continue to make them, but it only can go so far when you're really sort of up against a sort of 400 year old um, system. And in that kind of case, you know, you really do wish that you had more government support um, to make sure that we can make some of these sort of structural interventions around um, these sort of things. The other difficulty could is also that um, states are not neutral. States also have their own particular kinds of agenda. So, you know, um, even if let's say we're, you know, I'm a, as a black writer, I would like uh, state support, but I might have particular viewpoints around um, um, the government, or I might be critical of the government, for example. Um, and so, government, for example, might only want to sponsor a particular kind of of black writing, for example. So, it's a bit of a double-edged sword. If it was that they could just give us our money and sort of just not have any strings attached, that would be really, really great. Um, but then, you know, so it's, 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 
you have to also be pragmatic about some of these things as well because you know we, we want people to read and want people to write um, so I would I would say yes but then you also have to be aware of what the pitfalls about sort of the, the strings attached to, to the money that you, you're going to get one essay that I really really appreciate and is is something that that just link sort of my own practice as a writer, as a creative, to sort of how I think about um, women in my family is um, the essay by Alice Walker called In Search of Our Mother's Gardens, which really is such a beautiful essay and just thinking about what creativity and creative genius has looked like, um, particularly for women who are um, in um, oppressive societies, who don't have particular kinds of opportunities, and particularly just the idea of not only seeing creative genius as a particular kind of form, seeing it in um, sort of how they might literally um, garden or how they might have you know, done their crocheting or their knitting or whatever it is, whatever creative outlets that they might have had, um, and being able to recognize how their minds worked and, and really produce things that are you know, quite beautiful and full of intellect and, and, and energy, um, despite the sort of circumstances. And I think about it also right now, my grandmother recently passed away while I was here, and she was someone who was really just amazing. Um, she, for example, didn't go to school. And again, that, that does not mean that only until Western education comes that people start thinking, um, but just meaning that's just to say she didn't have particular kinds of opportunities, but yet um, she was the kind of person who would be like, would ask, you know, what's happening on Facebook or, you know, this global warming thing is so terrible. You know, she was that kind of person. And this is how stuff she just learned by listening to radio and catching on to conversations. Um, and that was just sort of seeing in action um, or in person, the idea of, um, of our, our mothers and our grandmothers' gardens and sort of the ways in which they found um, how they could water it for themselves and also the ways in which it hasn't always been nurtured and sort of the, the detrimental effects of that. So that, that essay is a really, really important one personally for me. I am really glad I've been able to get a lot of work done, not necessarily the work I thought I was going to get done here, but um, I've, I've been able to um, finish a couple of essays, which I'm really sort of happy with, and also just a large part of the writing process and the thing that I would refer to as the responsibility is really just informing yourself as much, um, reading as much as you possibly can, and also experiencing as much as you can is also really, really important. Um, and I've been able to do a lot of that while I've been here, so that's really, I think if there's anything I take away, is just the time I've had to sort of um, write and be productive because I literally had not written for two months before I came here and I was starting to feel very anxious about sort of what is happening can I still call myself um, a writer and um, I think sometimes just being outside of, of your home space can be quite good and um, Iowa City is also quite a small city it was just different from Johannesburg but I grew up in a, in a small town so it works for me as sort of a blank canvas to sort of get my work done um, yeah so that's that's been really great for me to get that work done here <laughs>